what a nice crowd. Sorry to interrupt, but we do have some speakers. Hello, I'm Corleen Kraft, president of the club, and it's very nice to see all of you. We're really excited today. We haven't heard from people involved with the State Board of Higher Education or from our public universities for quite a while, so we're very privileged today to have four representatives. It's entitled Higher Education in Oregon, Finishing Old Homework and Making New Assignments. And our guests are George Pernsteiner, who's act acting chancellor of the Oregon University System, Timothy Nesbitt, who's on the Oregon State Board of Higher Education, Gretchen Schutte, who's on the Oregon State Board of Higher Education, and Dr. Edward John Ray, president of Oregon State University. So we're looking forward to hearing their comments. But if you would be so kind as to please turn off cell phones or anything else that's going to make noise, I would appreciate it. Forks are okay. Forks clanking are okay. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. We will not be having a Friday Forum next Friday because of Memorial Day weekend. So I know you'll miss us and we'll miss you, but go to the beach. <laughs> However, you will be rewarded by our annual meeting speaker, who is Ketzel Levine. She is an NPR commentator and has co uh, been a commentator on politics and now does primarily special interest reporting. So we're looking forward to that, and that's on June 3rd, and that will be here. Now, I would like to bring up the dreaded subject of money because it's really important to us as a nonprofit organization that we rely on the goodwill of people who can enjoy what it is that City Club has to offer, enjoy and learn from. We have had uh, some very good members have uh, signed up for a challenge, and for every dollar up to $10,000 that members contribute in response to this challenge, these people will give a dollar. So these people are Don Frisbee and his wife Mary, Peter and Harriet Watson, Kaiser Permanente, and a donor who was given a gift in honor of Tom Deering. Now the letters about this challenge just went out a few days ago. You may have received yours, and we've already had $1,500 uh, in donations come in from our membership, so we really are very grateful for that and hope that you will join them. We have a few other things that will be coming up, things that would be events that will be coming up uh, at the City Club. Our annual Citizen Salons fundraisers have begun. We had one last week that was well attended, and People report that it was very interesting. Many points of view were expressed, but there were no fisticuffs. These, uh, because these citizen salons are dinners with very interesting hosts, and then there are the guest provocateur, with whom you can engage in conversations, whereas you might have not ever had the opportunity to see them up close and personal. All of the information about that is included in a little brochure that looks like this or it is online. Last year we had every one of them were sellouts, and so I would suggest that you read these, take your pick, and get registered. All of this information is available online, along with membership, invitation, or membership information, and I invite all of you who are not members to um, go online, become a member, and attend a citizen salon, although you do not have to be a member to attend the salon. A couple of other things that will be coming up. Uh, Local Innovations Bike Tour on Saturday, May 28th, where there will be a tour of various spots around town that illustrate environmentally, architecturally, or culturally significant innovations. And then in June, we're going to have a rooftop membership party and a tour of the Tillamook Forest. So all of that information is available online. You can also purchase audio CDs and videotapes of today's program if, if uh, you find that it's something you'd like to share with friends. Our sponsors this quarter are Pope and Talbot Incorporated, Providence Health Systems, and the architectural firm of Zimmer, Gunsel, and Frasca. And we're very grateful for their support because they underwrite our broadcasts. Now on to our program. George Bernsteiner, as I said, is the acting chancellor of the Oregon University System, and he will also act as moderator today. He became the acting chancellor in July of 2004, and among many other duties, he ensures support for the initiatives related to the board's vision for higher education in the state, including presentation of proposals to the legislature. He was previously vice chancellor for administrative services at the University of California, Santa Barbara, 
And prior to his work at UC, he was Vice President of Finance and Administration at Portland State University. And during part of that time, he was simultaneously the Chief Financial Officer at the University of Oregon and Vice President at PSU. He tells me that he has gone through many, many books on tape as he's traveled up and down, burning up and down I-5. <coughs> he holds a BA in Political Science from Seattle University and an MA in Public Administration from the University of Washington. Timothy Nesbitt is a member of the Oregon State Board of Higher Education and has been since 2004. He's also the CEO of the Oregon AFL and CIO. He previously served in management positions of the Oregon State Council of Service Employees International and held similar positions in California. He has served on governor-appointed task forces on workers' compensation and health care reform and he previously served on the board of the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center in Washington, D.C. He holds a BA in journalism from St. Bonaventure University in New York. Dr. Gretchen Schutte is a member of the Oregon State Board of Higher Education, also since the year 2004, and as well, she's president of Chemeketa Community College in Salem. Her previous positions include being superintendent of uh, school, superintendent in the Gresham Barlow School District. And she was the Dean of Distance and Continuing Education and Director of Portland Area Programs for Oregon State University, Executive Vice President of Mount Hood Community College, and served in various capacities, including being on the faculty at Lynn Benton Community College. She holds an interesting array of degrees, one at BA in English Literature followed from Smith College, followed by an MA in Biology from Central Michigan University, and finally, a PhD in oceanography from Oregon State University. She said she's just trying to figure out what she wants to do. <laughs> and finally, Dr. Edward John Ray, who's the president of Oregon State University and came in 2003. Prior to joining Oregon State, he served as executive vice president and provost of Ohio State University from 1998 to 2003. He was also a member of the economics faculty at Ohio State for more than 30 years, as well as serving in several senior administrative posts. He received his BA degree in mathematics from Queens College in New York, and his MA and PhD in economics from Stanford University. Please welcome our guests. Well, thank you, Carlene, and thanks to all of you for coming out today on a day when you couldn't figure out if it was going to rain or if it was going to have sunshine or if it was going to have snow or if it was going to have hail. It's a typical day in Western Oregon in the springtime, but thank you all for making it here. Uh, I want to thank those of you who, are, uh, who have been my good friends for a long time. I almost called you my old friends and then decided that would probably not be a good way to start this conversation, so thank you all for coming. What we're going to say today, in many ways, you've heard before. You've heard it before. Those with college educations make more money, they pay more in taxes, and they need fewer government services than those who do not. You've heard, too, that full success in a 21st century information-based global economy will demand higher levels of education than ever before, and that other countries, as well as other states, are beginning to make those investments in very big ways. You may even have heard that despite having less state support per student than do at least 45, and somebody told me the other day, 49 other states, Oregon's public universities are enrolling more students and producing more graduates than ever before. And they are producing them more quickly than they have in a very long time. But have you heard that higher education in Oregon is less affordable than higher education just about anywhere else in America, despite tuition rates that are just about average? Why? Have you heard that Oregon's universities have fewer regular faculty today than they did 10 years ago. 
but they have 20,000 students more today than they did 10 years ago. Have you heard that the faculty compensation for those faculty is among the lowest in the country, even after adjusting for PERS? Have you heard that the support that the federal government provides to faculty and students through research grants is almost equal to the support the state provides for the universities in any given year? Have you heard that the deferred maintenance backlog at the seven campuses now tops $600 million? Have you heard that more of this year's graduates will have transferred to the university than, and received degrees after having transferred, then start there and go all the way through? And have you heard that in many parts of this state, in many parts of Oregon, young people are less likely today to go to college, less likely today to participate 10 years from now in that global information-based economy in a full and successful way than are their parents or than are the people in the workforces of those communities today. We are reducing the educational level of many of the communities in Oregon and have been for the last dozen years. Last year, Governor Ted Kulangoski breathed new life into the State Board of Higher Education by appointing dynamic leaders to address these and other issues to transform Oregon. To transform Oregon into a state where every Oregonian, regardless of where she or he lives, regardless of how much money she or he may have or how much money his or her family may have, regardless of what group she or he may belong to, that that Oregonian, every Oregonian, can attend and succeed in a public university in this state so that she or he can go on to be a full participant, a full partner in a successful 21st century information-based global society. I am pleased to be joined here today by three of the people who are going to make that happen. Three of the people whose vision whose commitment, whose dedication, whose ideas will, in fact, help transform this state. And the first one is Director Tim Nesbitt, who heads the board's Affordability and Access Working Group. Thank you, George, Corlean, members of the club. Uh, as a former liberal arts student, I wanted to frame what I think is the central challenge we face in higher education today. The challenge to restore opportunity for all by referring to a, a figure in Greek mythology. For the last 15 years, more and more Oregonians seeking a college education have confronted the torture of Tantalus. It was the fate of Tantalus to have the grapes above his head rise when he attempted to eat and the water at his feet recede when he attempted to drink. He was doomed to have his reach forever fall short of his grasp. This too has been the fate of many low-income and middle-income families in Oregon who've been reaching for a college education. Tuition and fees at Oregon's community colleges and public universities have been rising far above the reach of their household budgets up 77% and 66% respectively during the past 10 years. Meanwhile, the state's commitment to financial aid has been shrinking to a smaller and smaller share of the overall costs of the education these Oregonians are, are seeking. Costs have been rising while aid has been receding. Oregon Opportunity Grants now cover only 11% of the cost of attendance at our public universities and are limited to students with family incomes below $31,340 per year. And even with such low targets, the program runs out of money every year before it can cover even half of all eligible applicants. As a result, the hopeful reach 
of many Oregonians for a college education has been falling far short of their grasp. And many others, unfortunately, have been giving up even trying to reach for that goal. After steep tuition increases in the early 1990s, we experienced a lost generation of 12,000 high school graduates and community college students who were qualified to pursue four-year degrees, but never did so. Over the next five years, we could experience another lost generation of 9,000 students if these trends persist. Contrast these trends to our Oregon Benchmarks goal of having 45% of our adult population with four-year degrees by 2010. We are now at 27%. And were it not for more college graduates moving here from other states, we'd be falling farther behind in meeting this goal. For the same reasons of increased costs and, de and decreased aid, students can no longer work their way through college as they could a generation ago. In the 1970s, a young adult could work full-time during the summer and 10 hours a week during the school year at the minimum wage and earn enough to pay tuition, books, and living costs at the University of Oregon. Today, even at Oregon's higher than national minimum wage, that same student would have to work 46 hours per week, 52 weeks of the year to cover for those same costs. As a result, students with, without the family resources to afford to pay for college must balance full-time work and part-time study and or take on crushing debt loads to complete their education. The typical student graduating from an Oregon public university today owes more than $20,000 in student loans. And for those who think that we are caught up in an unfortunate national trend of rising college costs and reduced student aid, consider this. When compared to the rest of the country, we are among the leaders in this race in the wrong direction. Oregon received an F for affordability in the 2004 and 2002 editions of Measuring Up, a study which ranks all states on common performance measures for higher education. We are now, we are now tied for 45th in affordability among the 50 states. The consequences of these trends are all too clear and all too severe. Lost opportunity and earning power for Oregon residents, failure to maintain the attractiveness of our business climate and our competitiveness in the global economy, less tax revenue, greater social costs. And if we are not attentive to these consequences, a vicious circle of not only lost opportunity, but declining incomes, less ability to pay for college, then fewer college graduates, fewer good paying jobs, and again, declining incomes and living standards. Governor Ted Kulongowski recognized these problems and vowed to fix them when he appointed me and my colleagues to the Board of Higher Education last year. And our board set up a broad-based access and affordability work group, co-chaired by myself and Ann Poppy from Portland Community College. We held 35 meetings and work sessions over a period of more than a year. And you've already heard some of our findings, some of what we identified as the problem. But let me focus on uh, the most important one. Yes, personal incomes in Oregon are slightly below average, so that's why we don't do as well on, in these national studies. And yes, tuition and fees at Oregon's community colleges and private universities are higher than average, but not that much higher than average if you look at all the other states. The most significant cause of our affordability gap is our failure to match the commitment of other states to need-based financial aid. Let me give you a few examples. If you look at the amount of state financial aid that we provide in Oregon across all of our undergraduates, whether or not they receive this aid, we provide $133 per enrolled undergraduate resident student per year. The national average is $354. In California, it's $367. In Washington State, it's $483. We are simply not doing enough to help Oregon students and their family and their families secure the education they want and need and the education that we as a state say we want them to have and need them to have. Students and their families are doing their part. They're committing more and more to the effort of securing a higher education for their benefit and ours. They're paying more from their family budgets. They're working more and they're borrowing more. And we as taxpayers are providing less and less in return. This is about money. 
And when it comes to money, we're not matching the commitment and effort of these new generations of students as our commitment and effort were matched a generation ago. So here's a summary uh, from our work group report, and the full report is available online on our website, www.ous.edu. But in summary, we looked at the existing Orbit Oregon Opportunity Grant as the key to what we need to accomplish. We talked about restructuring it, we talked about expanding it, but mostly we talked about investing more resources in that program. It's a good program, it can be made to work better, but it needs more resources. I'm pleased to say the governor put some real money on the table to meet that goal in his 2005-07 recommended budget. He proposed a 109% increase in the Oregon Opportunity Grant from 44 million to 92.3 million dollars. And we went to work in our work group to figure out how we could best use those resources. It turns out that even that amount of money gets us only halfway to what other states are doing, but it does allow us to do a lot. With the governor's recommendation, we'll be able to, at least at current income eligibility levels, serve all eligible students year round and not have to cut them off when we run out of money. We'll be able to extend coverage to part-time students and we'll be able to start increasing the amounts of the grants to those who currently meet the income thresholds. So over time, we want to see the Oregon Opportunity Grant be more like the Pell Grant, and so that middle-income families can benefit as well. Under the current structure, once you earn a dollar above that $31,340 in family income, you no longer qualify for any assistance from the state of Oregon. Under the federal Pell Grant model, you can continue to qualify for at least some assistance. There's a slope rather than a cliff. And it's that change alone, we think, over time that will make the Oregon Opportunity Grant reach the needs of Oregon's middle-income families as well as our lowest-income families. We were also able to um, reach agreement with our private colleges and their representatives on a system over time where, where we can direct more resources to students who choose to enroll in our lower-cost public institutions while not diminishing our historic levels of support for students who choose independent, not-for-profit institutions in Oregon. And this was an important agreement, I think, among all sectors of our higher education community. And finally, we want to continue to examine the possibility of having a long-term endowment in Oregon so that we'll have the funds available for need-based financial aid, whether or not we are in good budget times or bad or facing another economic downturn. Now, if you combine these improvements as recommended by the governor with uh, the recommendations in the budget for controlling tuition increases as well, we definitely have the opportunity to reverse direction in this next budget period and make higher education at least a little bit more affordable for middle-income families and a lot more affordable for low-income families. Unfortunately, we haven't yet reached agreement with the legislature on how to uh, act on the governor's recommendation. Uh, the Senate and House budgets are proposing only about half the increase the governor has recommended for the Oregon Opportunity Grant, while at the same time freezing tuition increases, which otherwise would have averaged about 5% a year. Now, both approaches, both the legislature's approach and the increase in the Oregon Opportunity Grant that I described earlier, represent important new steps forward and definitely are steps in the other direction, in the direction we've been heading in for the last several years. But, and we're engaged in a very important discussion now over whether it makes more sense to freeze tuition for all Oregonians and increase the Oregon Opportunity Grant a little or allow a moderate rise in tuition and increase the Oregon Opportunity Grant by a lot. Longer term, however, we want to measure our success not by what other states are doing as a important as it is to kind of take those, measurements, those measurements that we read in the Measuring Up report every two years, but by what we want to accomplish. We are looking now at a shared responsibility model that builds on the expectation that every student who seeks a higher education will commit his or her own resources and effort to that goal to the extent it's affordable and achievable for them, and to the extent he or she does so, that we will match their effort so that the cost, the cost is never again a barrier to reaching for and completing a college education. When Oregonians reach for college education, we want to ensure that their reach never again falls short of their grasp. Thank you.
Good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here today to talk with all of you about the imperative that college education is to the citizens of Oregon. As a community college president and also a member of the State Board of Higher Education, I have the particular perspective, and some would say the peculiar perspective, of having uh, been involved in these two roles in both sectors of public post-secondary education in Oregon, Oregon's public universities and Oregon's community colleges. As the chancellor has begun and board member Tim Nesbitt has continued, I'd like to just continue a review of some of the benefits of college education just to bring us together today at this hour around just how much it should matter to all of us that more Oregonians have a college education. Compared to a high school graduate, a person with a bachelor's degree will earn nearly a million dollars more over their lifetime. The more educated, the less unemployed. In 2004, Oregon bachelor degree recipients experienced an unemployment rate of 5.7 percent, students with some college were at 6.5 percent, and those with the high school diploma only were at 7.0 percent in the unemployment rate and workers who did not have a high school diploma had an 18% unemployment rate. Household poverty rates are also aligned with educational level. Nearly 20% of Oregonians without a high school diploma live below the poverty line. Only 5% of households with a bachelor's degree recipient live in such poverty. And reliance on public assistance is similarly correlated with education. And finally, Bachelor's degree recipients are nearly twice as likely to volunteer in their communities and have voting rates at over 80%. So clearly there are benefits for most Oregonians to having a college education and clearly there are benefits to Oregon for more people having that experience. So then around the table, as we've said it today, we need to ask the question, who is attending college and who graduates. And again, a few facts paint the landscape. For students in an Oregon high school serving families with high poverty rates, the odds of successfully completing the educational pathway are thin. Only 31% of the 2002 graduates from these high schools enrolled in college immediately, while 51% of the graduates from high schools in more affluent communities went immediately to an Oregon college or university. Minority students are less likely to enroll in college. Families that lack a history of attending college are also at greater risk of being left behind in the societal march toward the benefits of college education. And the lack of formal knowledge about even how to apply to college creates a major barrier to college access for many in these circumstances. So we ask, are we addressing the challenges, the dual challenges of a relatively low percentage of Oregonians with a college education, something like 30% of our population aged 25 to 65, and the serious access and completion gaps that exist along income lines, as well as other disparities. For example, and this has also been very important to the State Board of Higher Ed work group that I have chaired, are we providing access to communities all across the state? So are we addressing these challenges? The jury is definitely out. Uh, Oregon's young adults are even less likely to attend college today than they were in 1994. Recent U.S. Census Bureau statistics also reveal Oregon ranked 47th in the nation in terms of increase in the percentage of residents aged 25 and older who had a bachelor's degree. Our meager 1.4% increase during the years 1994 to 2004 was one-third the national average of 5.5%. There are many steps, no doubt, that must be taken for us to transform Oregon from a state that talks about education to a state that is about education, and one that maximizes the roles that community colleges can play to providing a skilled workforce and filling up the pipeline to baccalaureate 
degrees. Many other states have taken serious steps in recent years to address the fundamental need to have a college-educated population. If being competitive is a motivator for dreamy Oregonians, we are at risk of falling behind in relation to neighboring states like Washington or Oregon. In any case, we are at risk of failing in the simply stated challenge to have a skilled workforce in a college-educated population that can be productive and can change quickly in a changing world. Such abilities begin with education and continue with education that occurs throughout the careers of Oregonians. Now, many in Oregon are dedicated to finding ways to boost the output in a pipeline that now begins with 109th grade students and ends with only 15 of those students graduating with an associate's degree in three years or a bachelor's degree in six. And many are committed to making sure that we open the doors of education to all Oregonians. Members of the State Board of Education and members of the State Board of Higher Education, the governor, leaders of both parties in the legislature, and many others have their oars in these waters. In my remaining minute, I'll briefly mention several areas of focus for the State Board of Higher Education and the work group that I have chaired for the last 16 months or so. We have had our eye on student learning and student success, and the goal has been to have an impact across the state with new collaborative efforts. And our focus has been first on transfer, more effective transfer of students between community colleges and OUS campuses through transfer policies, better alignment of curricular pathways, and better use of technology to assist in advising. And the new Oregon Transfer Module that you may have heard about was a response to our recognition of the needs of many community college students and their need to transfer and transfer with greater ability to have their credits count. An exciting and related example of the cross-sector collaboration is what we're calling Oregon Atlas. And this is software that will enable students to use the internet to access information about how courses count toward different degree goals and what courses can be taken from which community colleges or OUS institutions to accomplish the next steps along their educational goals. An atlas will lead to more informed course and major decisions by students, fewer missteps, uh, the swirl that we've documented, and that's the technical term to reflect how Many students attend several of our colleges and universities over the course of their academic careers. That swirl will be supported by, um, through Atlas, having access to what's the best and most, most efficient way to continue to make progress on your degrees. A second arena is greater preparation of more high school students for college. And in this area, we're focusing on increasing access by using distance education, dual high school college enrollment, and increased acceleration learning opportunities for all students. Third, we're looking at increased student retention and graduation through sharing best practices. And fourth, increased accountability and effective student performance feedback to high schools and colleges through uh, sharing key data and through having linked data systems, K-12, community colleges, and OUS. I'd also love to talk, if I had time, about our increasing efforts in uh, dual enrollment of community colleges and universities. That's also a very effective strategy that we're encouraging and monitoring with over 4,000 students already um, participating. So I'll conclude with saying what you already know, that it's extremely important for us to focus on college completion for an individual and for the good of our state, um, for people to have opportunity. It is critical, and for the state to be strengthened, it's extremely important. Your community colleges and your universities have collaborated across a significant um, number of topics. We are partners in new ways and in several new activities, and it just may be that a new approach to public post-secondary education is emerging in Oregon. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon and to have the uh, opportunity to put on my economist hat. For many years, I've studied topics such as the political economy of international trade policy, 
here and abroad, the determinants of foreign direct investment, and the role of financial reform in economic development. I've also spent my professional life in higher education, specifically in land-grant universities, so I have a deep passion for the land-grant mission of education, research, and service, and I have an abiding commitment to the role of higher education in promoting economic development and social progress. Last month, the Oregonian published an interview with Josh Miner, retiring head of Intel's venture capital program. He lamented the lack of entrepreneurial activity here and a lack of support for this activity. He's correct, and he's right to be concerned. We need to understand that this is a national problem, not just an Oregon problem. It's severe, and it's deeply threatening to America's economic future. Last December, the Council on Competitiveness held a conference in Washington, D.C. It coincided with the President's Economic Summit, so it got very little press coverage. It deserved a lot more. Noting the astounding increase in university educational activity among our international competitors, the Council warned that the United States was, and I quote, at an inflection point, a unique and delicate historic juncture. We all know how the economies of Oregon and the nation are being transformed by the transfer of manufacturing jobs and more recently, service jobs overseas. Given differential wage rates and innovations in transportation and communication systems, this is not surprising and not reversible. As we lose these basic manufacturing and service jobs, however, we grow more dependent on our ability to generate innovations that create new industries. The Council is warning us that we won't maintain our lead as innovators by default. Let me cite a few facts. For decades, the U.S. led the world in the percentage of gross domestic product devoted to scientific research. Now. We trail Japan, Korea, Israel, Sweden, and Finland. We're not going to win the competition as innov for innovation from sixth place or worse. The number of scientific papers published by Americans peaked in 1992 and has declined 10% since. In the last decade, we've lost our leadership in scientific publications to Europe. For two centuries, Think about that. For two centuries, a higher percentage of Americans have gone to university than citizens of any other country. Today, several nations in Europe and Asia have caught up. Since 9-11, the number of foreign graduate students in American universities, and these are people who historically have been a major source of innovation for our economy, has dropped precipitously. What do these facts tell us? They tell us that our competitors have adopted a fundamentally new strategy to compete with us. No longer do they take our products and our innovations and systematically engineer quality improvements and cost savings into them, as the Japanese did with our automobiles. Today, they are recreating the structures that gave us our competitive advantage. China is building universities at an impressive pace, and this ought to get our attention. China is now home to research labs from Intel, Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, and Verizon. Our competitors are keeping their best and brightest students home, and in some industries, they are drawing our best and brightest too. They are investing in basic scientific research. They are creating centers of innovation, places like our Silicon Valley and the Research Triangle. They've made the development of new technologies national goals. Look at nanotechnology. This is an area of great importance for Oregon. In fact, it's so important and so promising that it is the top economic development opportunity identified by the Academic Excellence in Economic Development Working Group of the Oregon University system. I serve on that working group, along with Kirby Dias, formerly with Intel Capital, who is the chair, Greg Hammond from Clatsop Community College, Jack Isselman of Vista Strategies, and Duncan Wise of the Oregon Business Council. Many knowledgeable people forecast that nanotechnology will initiate the next 
great wave of innovations in manufacturing and economic prosperity. That's why it's been at the top of the list for ETIC funds from the state and the private sector. What's remarkable is that Oregon is not so much competing with other states for nanotechnology leadership as we are with first-rate scientists in Israel and Japan and elsewhere. They're not waiting for us to develop nanotechnology so they can polish up a few products later. They're using our model. They intend to own this technology. Here's what I think this means. I think it means we face a re regional challenge here in Oregon. I've talked about the Oregon economy and the opportunities and about the responsibility of my university and other OUS institutions to help improve this economy since I arrived. There is a lot we can do and there is a lot that the university system can do. We also face, and we can't lose sight of this, an enormous national challenge. We need to have a national response too. In large measure, America's most recent period of economic prosperity and leadership was built through private entrepreneurship and a strong business, university, government partnership that included massive federal investment in things like the internet and information technology and higher education and the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. What are we doing now? Well, the proposed 2006 federal budget cuts research funding by 3.4% in real dollars. At the national, as the National Governors Council noted in its 2004 report, governors in every state have adopted tactics to generate economic prosperity. Our own governor has clearly worked hard at this and with some success, but this won't be solved solely at the state level. The AEED Working Group has identified 11 opportunity areas for Oregon, of which nanotechnology is the topmost. We may add a 12th, the Pacific Rim, and I hope we do so. There's a handout available that lists these 11 areas. Let me summarize what I believe these goals mean. As a state, we must address access and affordability and academic preparation at every level, from pre garden pre-kindergarten through graduate school. It's not an accident that the working group is called academic excellence and economic development. There's a strong correlation between a state's median household income and its percentage of adults with bachelor's degrees. And of course, median household income correlates directly with tax revenues. As a state, and especially as the state's educational institutions, we have to work together collectively on the most promising areas for innovation. Nanotechnology, where ONAMI is really a wonderful model, neuroscience, information technology, and so on. No institution here is strong enough to win the major investments needed by itself, but we can combine our talent, our talented faculty to compete and win. The Oregon Nanoscience and Microtechnologies Institute, I believe, is the poster child for what a collaboration can accomplish. It is the collective genius of Portland State University, the University of Oregon, Oregon State University, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, Hewlett Packard, state and federal government partners, and new associates that will help us compete globally in markets for new products. We have to be at the forefront in helping our natural resource industries and the communities that depend on them to prosper in a way that is economically sound and sustainable. Everybody has to benefit, and they can. As I've said before, we need to break down some of the perceptual barriers between the so-called new industries and old industries. The only germane question is, is it a competitive industry? And if not, what can we do to make it competitive? We need to pursue best business practices and cutting edge technology in every sector of the economy. Natural resource-based industries like agriculture, timber, and wood products, recreation, and seafoods are key sectors of our economy, and we must be globally competitive in each of them. 
We have to take advantage of the people and programs we have already that can help us develop the new energy technologies and the practices of sustainability. The nation that becomes the leader in these areas will have enormous advantages. Finally, as Richard Florida and others pointed out, we need to create and maintain a state where the artistic and creative people who drive innovation and who attract other in innovators want to live. This means cultural richness, recreational opportunities, and vital communities that are safe and provide good, public good private health care and educational opportunities and jobs. Clearly, Oregon has some real advantages here, but we've got to leverage them. That's the challenge. We need to continue addressing it. We need to celebrate our progress, like the impact of the state investments through ETIC, the Engineering and Technology Industry Council. We need to continue to use scarce state resources in targeted investments and partnerships with business and higher education. We can do a lot as a state. We also need to recognize that national solutions and national strategies are essential because America is really at a very critical juncture and our economic future is not guaranteed. Thank you. Well, quote Thomas Friedman, the world is flat. I'd like to introduce now our board host, Marcus Simentel. He's a member of the Board of Governors and he uh, chair, er, shares responsibility for oversight of the issue committees. He's a retired uh, farmer and has a master's degree in education from Portland State University. As you can see, people who want to ask questions can line up at the mic, the single microphone apparently. And I would ask, because we're running late, uh, if everyone can make their questions very succinct because we have four people who might answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Curleen. Thank you, uh, first, I want to call your attention to the Chancellor's good taste in choosing a tie, selecting a tie to wear. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many of you read Steve Dean's column the other, uh, yesterday, but it talked about George, the state of Georgia and what they're doing with their lottery dollars. And that uh, in Georgia, as a result of the way they choose to spend their lottery dollars, any high school graduate who has a B average or better gets college, a college scholarship in the state system. Their graduate, their uh, rate of uh, kids going from high school to their own college and universities has tripled since they started that. Their brain drain, the best and the brightest, are staying home. And although uh, our governor has said, okay, 92 million instead of, what was it, 40 some, 10 million for opportunity grants, I'm sorry, that just doesn't cut it. If we're going to solve the problems that Oregon has, we need to have a uh, much higher percentage of our kids going to college, and they ought to go to college here in Oregon. I think my, my question for the board, really, the Board of Higher Education is, what else can be done to try and increase that number from, I forget the percentages, but it was like 26% here in Oregon. That ought to be 40%. 50%. What else can we do? I'd, I would off, offer a partial answer, and I hope I reflected it to some extent in my remarks, that we need to use fully um, the community college system in partnership and in collaboration with the university system. Um, in 1947, the Truman Commission created community colleges so that there would be access to low-cost public education. And I think we've made a great start this year in working together to more fully utilize that opportunity. Of course, uh, tuition is going up at Oregon's community colleges as well. And I think we just need to um, work with the uh, Oregon Opportunity Grant and try to get the aid up and then make sure that the pathways are broader that each uh, individual institution's structural barriers are reduced and that we continue to work together on having these simpler border crossings across our institutions that will help. But it's not a complete answer to the uh, multiple years of disinvestment in post-secondary education. That's what really needs to happen. If, let me uh, talk about two things that we're doing that I'm pretty excited about. 
One is uh, we have, uh, 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 Gretchen mentioned, the uh, dual enrollment agreements. These are agreements students are simultaneously enrolled in the community colleges and at uh, Oregon State University. So there's no issue of transfer. They're simultaneously enrolled in both. We now have agreements with nine of the 17 community colleges. We will have agreements with 11 by the end of June. I want to have an agreement with every community college. This is a program we started with Lynn Benton Community College in 1998. In a six-year period, we have enrolled over 4,000 students in the dual enrollment program. We currently have more than 2,000 in our ongoing dual enrollment programs, and we've had 1,000 students get their bachelor's degrees since 1998 who started in the dual enrollment program. We've also started a kind of demonstration project la lately in, uh, in our region. I, I'm sort of the least informed of the group, so I buy lunch. But basically, we get a group together that includes Sam Stern, the uh, dean of our School of Education, Pat Bedori, who is the superintendent of schools in Albany, uh, Don uh, Tarjan, Jim Ford from Corvallis, Pete Tawana from Philomath. And we've been sitting around and just talking about what do we need to do to focus on student success? Forget about systems, forget about turf. What can we do to collaboratively to make P20 work as effectively as possible? One of the, to give you an example of one of the ideas we came up with that costs nothing, is next week we're gonna have a pizza and soda party for about as many of the 150 freshmen who show up who came from those three school districts. And we're gonna have administrators from the high schools and from the university responsible for the first year experience to have a kind of voice of the customer session where we have the students tell us what was right and what was wrong about their preparation coming into the university and what's been right and what's been wrong about the kind of support they've gotten while they're at the university. I think we just need to be a lot more creative than we have. And as, as Gretchen and Tim noted earlier, a lot of us are working really hard to be smarter with the resources that we've got. If I could just say, um, <clears throat> second what Ed said in terms of uh, extending our efforts beyond the boundaries of our campuses, both community colleges and the uh, four-year uh, institutions, we have to do a better job of reaching out uh, to high school students. Actually, the Oregon Student Assistance Commission has a fairly modest and low cost, but very effective program called Aspire that gets counselors into high schools to work more closely with students. I think that ought to be expanded. We would, um, I think we'd be well served, uh, obviously, if we had the kind of investment that Georgia has, but I think we would not necessarily, based on the uh, insights that uh, our work group had into that program structure, uh, our program identical to that of the one in Georgia, we would um, want to seek to reward better preparation, but not, but not necessarily based on, on uh, high school grades and, and test scores. Uh, one proposal that we've already come up with is to find a way to provide an extra uh, financial bonus to students who qualify for the Opportunity Grant who have completed the SIM, the Certificate of Initial Mastery. Uh, we think that makes a lot of sense. It's a good measure of preparation, and it's a good way to uh, create incentives for students to become better prepared. All of the things that, that people have mentioned are important, and they're improvements in a system we already have in place, and they're important improvements that help students. But what they don't do, and what Georgia did with the HOPE Scholarship, is to change the way people thought to change the belief system, to change the life expectations of people throughout the state. We have in Oregon, and have had for as long as I can recall, a mentality of scarcity. And I spend most of my days in Salem, and I, I understand that. But if we want to really change this state, if we want to really provide the opportunities to the next generation and the generation after that to be fully successful, we have to change our own thinking to one of abundance. And that is going to be a major change. It's going to be a major change, especially in those parts of the state where fewer people today go to college than did 10 years ago. It's going to be something that we all need to commit to and work on. And yes, we're not going to get there if we're 47th or 49th in appropriations per student. We know that. But money's not the only thing. Money's important. 
but it is not the only way we get there. We have to change the way that we think, all of us. I'm David Roth, a member. Uh, I wanted to pick up on uh, Mr. Pernsteiner's uh, last remark and ask a question of Tim. Everyone knows that uh, higher ed in Oregon has been a major victim of Measure 5. And you, as your uh, head of uh, 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 labor in Oregon, have spent a lot of time trying to persuade uh, the business community that they should uh, resist the temptation to drive, to continue driving down their share of the tax burden in the state in order to enable the state to recoup the fortunes it once was so proud of, especially at the level of higher education. And, um, my question is, what kind of luck have you had and how have you succeeded? Forcing me to change hats, David. Um, we have not had that discussion on the, on the uh, higher ed board. You've heard what we have discussed and what um, improvements and reforms I'm, we I'm recommend. Thinking. You also heard me say, to some extent, it is about money. And uh, Chancellor Pertsteiner says, and other things. But there's no doubt the uh, financial commitment has to be there. If we could just match the financial effort uh, as citizens and taxpayers that we made a generation ago, we'd solve all the problems in our education system from grade school through graduate school. And an analysis of where the tax effort is lacking, where it has lagged, has to go to the um, business tax effort, because individuals are pretty much paying close to what they've been paying as a percent of personal income over the last several decades. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member. Uh, I want to follow up on that. I happen to be uh, involved in a statewide business organization called the Oregon Business Association. Uh, we recently had a, le a meeting with the uh, legislative leadership, uh, ours and D's, House and Senate, and we told them that we had three priorities as, as a statewide business organization for the state, and they were education, education, and education. And we said if there isn't enough uh, resources ultimately to pay for what we need to do in education to have a viable economy for the long term, we'd step up uh, and uh, try to do our fair share as businesses to help pay the bill. Um, and we said that in part because a lot of our members travel and they see China and India and they're eating our lunch when it comes to preparing for the next, uh, next few decades. So my question is, all of you change hats, how do we get the Republicans in the House and how do we get uh, the people who voted uh, uh, for Measure 30 to agree with all of us? I don't think your problem's in this room, but how do we get the people who think we're just spending too much to begin with to move beyond that? <laughs> Is that one mine? <laughs> I, I think we're at a point, I think Ed, Ed mentioned it earlier, that the country is at a critical point. I think that we have to find a way, and we haven't found it yet, to show the people of this state that, is it, that it is in their best interest and in their children's best interest and in their grandchildren's best interest to change the investments that are made in education in the state. And until we can tie it to something that people can see as advantageous to them, I don't think we're going to be able to change it. And that's the real challenge as, as we think about how do we do that. And frankly, uh, the, the challenge is coming from other countries. Uh, some people may see that that will help us in the argument, but other people will say they don't care. And so it really has to be almost how do we tailor it, tailor that message in a way that can hit every person where every person cares. And I think that's a real tall order. So if you've got great ideas, I want to hear them. I, I, could I just add briefly, I would answer in a word, leadership. And I appreciate the leadership of the Oregon Business Alliance and many others with their oars in the water on this, but we need to have a coalescing of leadership in very vibrant, overt, dramatic leadership at this time, because we are in a crisis. Thank 
Justin Gottlieb, City Club member. Uh, I want to go back for a moment to the debt load that students carry. Uh, I am a graduate of PSU in the last five years of their master's program. And since graduating, I have not earned uh, in a yearly sum an amount that exceeds my debt load. So I will not be paid off uh, until I'm almost 50 years old. Um, just to give a real world face to that. And just want to know what you are doing as an organization to get your students who have paid this money into career positions, working with businesses, making sure that the investment that we as students put forward is realized over the course of our lifetime. There are a variety of programs that are underway at each of the campuses now, and they take two forms. The first form is to, to help students understand what debt is with respect to student financial debt and how to better manage that, both before they take it out and after they've taken it out. So part of it deals with, with how do you manage credit, if you will. The, the second, then, is we have some, uh, particularly at, at, at the larger universities, some very uh, uh, career-oriented um, counseling services that are available that will help people to, to, to get the kinds of, of jobs that they are looking for. It isn't, has not been easy in the Oregon economy of the last four or five years. Uh, we've gone from having the highest, we've had the highest unemployment rate in the country for, for much of that time. Uh, we no longer do, so I think it's a, a little easier for our graduates coming out now than maybe it was in the last few years for folks, but it is something that we do pay attention to, and Ed probably knows more than I. Well, I, I just would say that, uh, you know, you can do more immediate things and, and more long-term things immediately. We've eliminated plateau charges at Oregon State University, so we're going to have to figure out how to manage about $2 million in, uh, in cuts in our programs because we understand that for students to be able to graduate in four years, they got to take 15 credit hours a quarter, and if it costs more than 12, we're discouraging them from finishing. So we've eliminated the plateau charges. Nobody's compensating us for that. Uh, I think uh, longer term, uh, we're doing what we can through programs like MECOP, CCOP, to get students internships with businesses. 85% of those uh, internships turn into uh, jobs for students. We're also on the, uh, uh, we're in the quiet phase of what we would call the university fundraising campaign. And a very important part of that campaign will be raising money for scholarships and fellowships for students so that we can give more grants and uh, reduce the extent to which they have to be dependent upon loans to pay for their education. We're trying to grow our resource base regardless of what the st state does, and we're trying to put a lot of those resources into support for students. We're uh, significantly past our typical end time of 1.15. Are, <clears throat> are you on the panel able to stay f until 1.30? Uh, all right, any of you who...